everybody. Welcome to Coffee House Church. Uh, my name is Ben Russell. I am the, uh, the campus pastor at Grace Church in Sebring, which is on Thunder Road Road. This is my friend Jake. Um, he is going to be helping me out, lead us in worship tonight. So if you would, uh, can you stand up? I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and um, open us up with a word of prayer, asking the Lord to, to be among us this, this evening. Father, we are just grateful for the opportunity to gather as your people um, in, the, in the midst of a crazy week of a crazy year. This is, um, this is literally feeding our souls when we come together and we acknowledge who you are as your people. And we encourage one another with, a, with conversation and even just with each other's presence. And as we sing, Father, I pray that um, your, you would abide in the praises of your people and that you would um, draw us closer to the to the throne and to your cross this evening. In your name I pray. Amen. I want to start off with uh, raise a hallelujah. Sing it if you know it.
Celebrate this evening, Father. Just thank you for your presence. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. I just want to let you guys know um, there is an offering uh, box on your way out, obviously, at Coffee House Church. We don't pass a plate. And so we want to let, let you know that that's available to you if you've come prepared to give as a part of your worship this evening. We're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing Yes, I Will next.
think we have the words to this one. This is a mighty to save, and this is a, an older song that super familiar to me, so if you guys don't know it, you can uh, just think about the words of this song, because it's super powerful. And if you know it, sing it loud, because we're going to need your help. <laughs> Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. And hope of The thing that we, the one that we rest our hope in. Spirit, as we go into a time of uh, listening to your word, pray that this wouldn't be a passive time, that we would be active. That we inspect your word and the, the encouragement of the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. That we would be ready and we would have ears to hear what, you're, what you have to say to us as our Heavenly Father. Jesus, as we 
fall on our knees before you tonight. We pray that this would be an outflowing and an outpouring of our, our daily communion and our walk with you. That that blood that you shed on the cross and the forgiveness that you won for us, the thing we could never deserve, we could never have earned, you gave us freely. And that kind of love has to change the way we live. So, Father, I pray that as we gather tonight that you would draw our hearts into yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. to throw spitballs, right? <laughs> um, as I stood there at the back, I was thinking of the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said that Christians should live their lives in such a way that it causes unbelievers to doubt their faith their disbelief in God. And, you know, what Bonhoeffer is talking about is a winsomeness. It's one of my favorite favorite words. It's one of my favorite qualities of Jesus, apart from being the Son of God, of course. Um, he had a winsomeness. Uh, there was just something about him that made people want to be around him. And when you were around him, you thought to yourself, I want some of that. Ben has been a good friend of mine uh, for some time now. And tonight, he came and brought his friend Jake to catch some video footage of our Coffee House Church so that he could work his magic um, and do a little promo video for us to make everybody in Seabring and Highlands County want to come to Coffee House Church. And I walked through the door tonight and my heart just sank because I forgot to let Ben know that Josh is still sick and still doesn't have the results of his COVID test, which I'm sure is negative. I'm positive it's negative. I'm positive it's negative. But We've just made a decision that part of our commitment to your health and safety is if someone's sick, you need to stay home unless we know for certain that you ain't got it. And so I walked in tonight prepared for a prayer, a little message, and good night. Thanks for coming, everybody. And Ben turned to me and said, do you have a guitar? <laughs> I said, no, I don't have one, but I'm sure there's one around here somewhere. And Ashley actually ran home and got her guitar. Uh, it was one of, the, one of the benefits of living close. Sometimes there are more downsides than upsides, but, but when you need something real quick, it's, it, it's handy. Um, all that's to say, if, if I were an unbeliever, and I were watching Ben Russell do what he does, I would think to myself, I want some of that. Um, if that's what brethren Christian do, I'll be a brethren. <laughs> and I keep saying one of us has got to cross over. You know, either I've got to be brethren or he's got to be Methodist. And um, until tonight, I haven't seen much hope of either of those things happening. <laughs> But when he jumped in and said, give me a guitar, I thought, yeah, I want some of that. Because the truth is, if, if, if I had walked into somebody else's church and the preacher hadn't showed up, I don't, I don't think I'd be jumping up to the pulpit. 
I'd like to think I would. I'd like to think that I had that holy boldness. Pray for it all the time. But I just don't know. It makes me wonder. So thank you. Um, thank you, Beth. Um, so Lord, uh, we thank you that we can gather here tonight as Ben has already prayed. And we're all here by divine appointment. None of us are here by accident. We're all here for a reason. We're all here for a purpose. And you've got a word, you've got a message for each and every one of us. Maybe a different word for different people. We thank you that whatever need we brought with us this evening, that you meet us at our deepest point of need. But you don't give us your grace according to our need, but rather we're reminded from Paul's letter to the Ephesians that you meet our needs out of the riches of your grace. And so, Lord, we just wait in, ante in eager anticipation to feel the riches of your grace tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I was... Uh, I was 16 years old, sitting in the movie theater, and I was stunned. I thought he was lying. But I was hooked from the moment that Darth Vader said, no, I am your father. I was hooked not only on the epic saga of the Skywalker family, but on the literary device of... Help me out, Michelle. It's called the plot twist, right? The plot twist. <laughs> you know, I think one of the reasons that I I love this book, again, apart from it being the Word of God and its life changing impact on me, is because as a work of literature, it is absolutely genius and it is full of plot twists. It's the ram caught in the thicket. It's the Hebrew baby that's raised in the house of Pharaoh and then defies Pharaoh and leads his people to freedom. It's the Jewish girl that becomes a Persian queen. It is God coming to his own creation as a baby. It is Jesus walking out of the grave. So we're in this series in the book of Ephesians right now about one of God's great plot twists. That we are saved not so much to give us an escape hatch to heaven, but that we might become ambassadors who bring heaven to earth. And so we're going to pick up this evening where we left off in Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember we always got to figure out what it's there for. And if we go back to what we talked about last weekend in verses 1 to 10 of this passage, we see that Paul is talking about the grace of God, the work of Christ on the cross, that we have been resurrected, that we have been redeemed, that we have been regenerated, and that we are becoming the people that God destined us to be. Verse 11, therefore, remember that formerly... You who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I kept looking around for you, uh, Ben. You missed this wonderful speech that I just gave about. Is it, did he leave again? Is he yeah, going he again? Left he left again. <laughs> so, He's practicing. Anyway. Oh, what? Well, practicing the last song? Yeah. <laughs> Lord have mercy. What is God up to? Yet another plot twist. And not just the merging of two worlds, the two worlds of heaven and earth. 
It is the merging of two peoples into one community of Jews and Gentiles into the family of God together. Now we go all the way back to the book of Genesis. We find that the descendants of Abraham were marked by God. They were chosen by God. They were blessed by God to carry out his purposes in the world. And so the, of course we know that the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. Jesus was a Jewish man living in a Jewish context with a very Jewish teaching and Jewish fulfillment of Messianic promises. But then there was this plot twist. There were these Gentiles that wanted to start following the message and the teachings of the way of Jesus. They were Gentiles that wanted in on the family of God. And one of the great questions facing the early church was, is that even possible? Now, it's really hard for us to put ourselves back in that ancient context of the story to understand what a big deal this was. But in the ancient world, Jewish people and Gentile people, and of course Gentiles were anybody who wasn't Jewish, they didn't get along with each other. In fact, there was a lot of animosity between them. In fact, Gentile people didn't like Jewish people for a lot of reasons. One, they thought Jewish people were lazy because it was one day a week that they didn't work. And they thought that Jewish people were atheists because they only believed in one God, and that God was the only God. And they were just plain weird because they practiced this brutal thing called circumcision. But then, all of a sudden, the Gentiles, they want in on the family. And in the beginning, Jewish believers thought, well, you can't follow Jesus unless you become Jewish. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the law. And then the apostles in Acts chapter 15 decided the Gentiles didn't have to do all of that. They only had to follow three things to be a part of the family. Number one, they had to abstain from idolatry. Number two, they had to abstain from sexual immorality. Number three, they had to abstain from bloodshed. Now that seems like a pretty low bar to set until you understand how integral to the fabric of Roman life pagan temple worship was. Idolatry and, and immoral sexual practices were part of everyday Roman life. And the blood sport found in the Colosseum was basically the equivalent of a golf course in Sebring. It was everywhere. And it was almost impossible to be a Gentile follower of Jesus and to be a respected member of Roman society. So the early church faced this tremendous external pressure from the culture and this unbelievable tension internally because of this clash of cultures. And the great question facing the early church was, can they do it? Would this great plot twist of two people coming together really work? How are these two groups supposed to worship together when they have two very different standards of holiness? How are they supposed to eat together when they have different dietary laws? How is a Jew supposed to go into a Gentile's house without becoming unclean? How can Gentiles be followers of Jesus without losing their job? Would the way of Jesus be compelling enough to make them love one another? Would the message of Jesus be strong enough to make them look past their differences and would their commitment to Jesus be greater than their loyalty, opinion, allegiance, and alliance to anything else? You see, being invited to be a member of the family of God, that, was, that required absolutely no work on their part at all. We talked about that last week. Grace and grace alone. But living, living in the family of God, would take every ounce of energy they had. And sometimes I think we get it a little bit backwards that we spend so much time and energy trying to make ourselves right with God and completely neglect any effort to make ourselves right with one another. And so Paul says here, remember. And he used that word remember twice in this section of verses. And the Greek word doesn't just mean recalling facts. It's not just thinking back to recall something in the past. Like, I can never remember where I left my keys. I don't know if anyone else has that problem. It's not about accessing 
facts that happened in the past, but rather it's about accessing the memory, the feeling, the learning that came along with that moment. It's the same word that Jesus uses in Luke 17, verse 32, when he says, remember Lot's wife. What he's not saying is just recall the fact that Lot had a wife. No, he's talking about the important lesson that went with the story of Lot's wife. Remember the example of Lot's wife. Paul says, remember my chains. Remember the poor. It's about remembering in such a way that it reshapes the present moment. And so Paul is saying to the Gentile believers, remember, remember. And then he starts swinging. He says, remember, you were separated from Christ. You were excluded from the covenants of the promise. You had no hope. You were without God in the world. Tell us what you really think, Paul. At the same time, Paul, is, that he is beating up on the Gentiles a little bit, he also throws this little jab at the Jewish part of the church. Because we see Paul talking about you Gentiles. Those of you who are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. And then he makes this little parenthetical commentary, which is done by human hands. And it's easy for us to miss that, and we're just reading over that text. But, but made by human hands is the same phrase used to describe the process of making an idol. Now, circumcision, of course, we know was commanded by God. It was given by God. It was meant to be a mark, a seal of, the, of their chosenness, of their blessing, of their part of the purposes of God in the world. But what Paul is saying is, is that don't turn God's chosenness of you into an idol. Don't be arrogant. Remember. And then we come to verse 13. But now, a conjunctive adverb, but now, plot twist. But now, in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You're invited into the family of God. You're included in the promise of God, and you're commissioned to be on mission with God to bring heaven to earth. But now. And then we keep reading. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with which its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both access to the Father by the one Spirit. When it says that he destroyed the barrier, that dividing wall of hostility, that is not just metaphorical language. In the second temple period, there was literally a wall in the temple constructed to separate the Jewish place of worship where the presence of God could be encountered with where the Gentiles could come. In fact, archaeologists have discovered what appear to be ancient no trespassing signs. That wall ensured that the Gentiles were kept out. But when Jesus died on the cross, he removed that barrier. He removed that dividing wall of hostility. And then Paul goes on to use the word peace four times. It's one of the highest concentration of Paul's discussion of peace in any of his writings. It's that plot twist that the chosen people of God are expected to live in peace with these uncircumcised people who don't follow the law, who have the smell of pork on their breath, that don't observe the Sabbath. And Paul says peace has been made in Christ. And here's the problem today, is that we don't necessarily feel the challenge or this tension that Paul is dealing with. Or do we? <laughs> Maybe we do feel that today. But like Paul, I suggest to you that we do live in a time when we have to be peacemakers and bridge builders across chasms, culturally, racially, 
politically, geographically, and through his word afresh, God is challenging us to commit to forging that new community. And I've said this so many times, peace is not passivity. Peace is not turning a blind eye to reality. Peace is not, not about saying, well, you know, let's just not talk about this. Let's just not rock the boat. Peace is about rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work of committing to forming a new community that Jesus has called us to. The point of peacemaking is not to get everybody to agree, to have the same opinion, to have the same mindset. But rather, it's will, being willing to put Jesus at the center of the conversation and then to love regardless. Love is not some kind of sappy, sentimental kumbaya, oh, I've got my truth and you've got your truth and we're all okay, okay. let's just all get along. It's self-sacrificing love. In 1962, Martin Luther King Jr. was given a speech in Birmingham when a 200-pound white protester stormed onto the stage and started swinging his fist. As Dr. King's aides ran to his defense, he just wrapped his arms around the assailant. And as things calmed down, he introduced his attacker to the crowd as though he were an invited guest. Love, regardless, does not mean agreeing with somebody else's opinion. Dr. King did not agree with his opinion that day. It is not putting a stamp of approval on someone's behavior or choices, but rather it is what Jesus did on the cross. When you open your arms wide to embrace and protect even the one that seeks to harm you. And that takes hard work. Peacemaking is not easy, and it will take every ounce of energy that we have. Eugene Peterson said, peace is always a process, never a finished product. The finished product is that Jesus destroyed the wall of separation. He took all the excuses away. The product is that Jesus invited Gentiles to the table. He removed the barriers to being a part of the family of God. Just like the early church, living in that reality will take every ounce of energy that we have got. In Revelation chapter 2, we find a letter that the Apostle John writes to the church at Ephesus. And in that, he says, you have fallen away from your first love. Do the works that you did at first. Now, we often immediately interpret that to mean that they have fallen away from their first love, their first love being Jesus. But I think that given the context, it is also about them falling away from their first love of one another. Because it is so much easier to hide underneath hashtags and to retreat to our echo chambers and to love people who think like us and look like us and talk like us and vote like us. And John is saying, do the hard work that you did at first. And then Paul goes on to say, reflect the character of God to the world. And we keep reading, and he says, consequently, conjunctive adverb, consequently, plot twist. We are citizens. We are family. We are the new temple. It's about showing the character and the ways and the mission of God to the world. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him... You too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And so Paul says, first of all, you are citizens of a kingdom, the kingdom of God. That is your first allegiance. You are invited into the family. You are invited to the table. We are brothers and sisters. We have access to the same father. And then he says this really interesting thing, that you are a temple that is being built together. You are rising to become the place where God's presence is felt in the world.
where people engage and encounter the presence of God when they come into contact with our community. This week, I read about a very cool plot twist in a musical called Sunday in the Park with George. And it explores the life and work of the 19th century artist George Surratt. And George Surratt was interested in color theory and in pointillism and what was then called the emerging science of optics. And it's specifically about his painting Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, which you all know. You may not know the name of it, but you all know it. It hangs in the Institute of Art of Chicago. As I say, you may not know the name, but everyone's familiar with this iconic painting. In the first half of the musical, we find Surratt in his studio painting on this wall-sized canvas, dot after dot after dot, and speaking of plot twists, sorry, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, yeah. That's what you were supposed to see first. <laughs> And the music of the score matches the intensity and the insanity of his work. And visitors come into his studio and they think he's lost his mind because of this splattering of red and yellow and greens. And then the plot twist happens, which you've just already seen. When the painting is complete, the viewer stands back to see this, where they catch a view of the entire wall size canvas and realize that this is not a random disorganized splattering of dots, but rather these dots come together to create something completely new. Each one of these dots retains its original color, retains its original shape, but they come together to create a brand new image. And not only that, there are colors that pop on this painting that aren't physically on the canvas because the eye is optically mixing them as you look at it. And I would suggest that this is what Jesus is trying to do in his family with citizens of his kingdom, with his church, and with his temple. And now back to verse 10. We talked about this last weekend, that we are God's workmanship, his poema, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, prepared for us in advance, it is where each person retains their individual uniqueness, where they retain their unique God-given imprint and personality and culture. And yet, when they come together, they form a new image, the image of the body of Christ, the temple of the living God, where people find new color and new perspective and new vision for the world. It's where we are brought together by God's Spirit if we will remember that it is not about anything that we have done, but rather what Jesus has done. And if we will commit to walking the hard path of reconciliation, if we will commit to coming to the table and staying in the conversation and playing the long game, if we commit to being a reflection of God, to the world around us. If you're here this evening and you've never accepted that invitation that Jesus has offered to be a part of his promises, to be a part of his family, if you have never encountered Jesus and his freedom at the cross, I want to invite you to do that tonight. There are people here, members of our prayer team, who would love to pray with you. You guys just have one, because like some weeks you have your thingy, and some weeks he's got his thingy, and some weeks I walk out and forget mine. I've got extra ones. I'll give you some to keep in your in a glove box in your car. How about that? Steve and Jerry are part of the team, by the way. <laughs> so is Charika. They would love to pray with you and for you. So I want to invite our worship team <laughs> to come. This evening, as we say, our Father who is in heaven, holy, holy, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
Well, would you stand with us as we sing one last song? We're going to sing um, Build My Life Together.
built upon your love in the sense that you have already accomplished everything that is required for us to be remade and restored and renewed in the cross. You've already built the foundation. But there's a there's another sense, Father, and this is I think what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across in Ephesians and Pastor David was sharing with us this evening. Where we have to build our life upon your love, meaning we need to actually put it into practice. We need to love our neighbor as ourself, whether that's, uh, even when it's difficult, even when we don't understand them, when we disagree with them, because you love them, and you, you died for them, same as you died for us. So Father, would you help us to build our life on your love, that we would just follow your example Greater love is no man than this, to lay one's life down for his friends. You set the bar high, but your grace is sufficient for us, Father. And I just pray that in these moments you convict us, that you show us the folks that you've called us to love, to share your gospel with, to whatever it is, Father, that you would move in us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. It is a firm foundation in the middle of the world that is full of chaos. As we go from this place, Father, I pray that we would be encouraged and that you would bring us back again together next week, celebrate you and encourage one another. In your precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.